Thanks for joining us for this episode of Coffee with Closers, where business leaders share insights on how to build businesses from the ground up and best practices for innovating in their industry. Hey, Greg, I'm super excited to have you join me for this episode of Coffee with Closers. I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Oh, thanks. It's great to be here. Yeah, I've been I've been wanting to have you um, as a guest for quite some time because obviously you had a very successful um, entrepreneurial journey. Um, some some people would call it, you know, to have exit a company is definitely one of those, um, you know, those uh, amazing uh, peak of a of an entrepreneur's life. Um, but can you share a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey of how you sure. became an entrepreneur and how you even started your first company? Right. So this kind of goes back to 2004, I guess. I was uh, uh, had been working in an operational role at a printing company and uh, really enjoyed that, but got very interested in the technology aspect of the company. Uh, I went back to grad school, got a master's degree in management information systems, and uh, the printing company I was working for was acquired by a larger printing company that had a very strong focus on, on technology and, and software development to support uh, printing and uh, they were kind enough to promote me to their um, be in charge of their information technology. So um, I, w- I was in that role and we had a customer come to us and say, you know, I'd really like to be able to order my printed materials through a web browser. We thought, well, that sounds interesting. Uh, we took a look. We found a, a vendor that uh, said they had a solution that would support that. Uh, we tried to implement it. It uh, did not go well, unfortunately. And kind of at the 11th hour, myself and, and one of the developers on staff kind of rolled up our sleeves. And, and we just uh, cobbled together a very simple you know, um, website where someone could go in and, and order some printed items. Um, customer was happy. Uh, for me, it was kind of a, a real eye opener. I just thought, wow, you know, this is again. Remember, remember the time, e-commerce was certainly uh, prevalent, but it was at that point still a little bit more retail focused, mm-hmm. and uh, it was just kind of underscored to me that uh, e-commerce is going to touch uh, every aspect of commerce. Um, you know, even even ink on paper, you know, is is going to be ordered through uh, through a web browser. Um, you know, the, the printing company I was working with, a uh, great group of people, but uh, unfortunately I could kind of see the handwriting on the wall in terms of the longevity, longevity of the company and I knew it was time to uh, uh, go out and start looking for something else and I thought, you know, I just really enjoyed that project of, uh, you know, bringing print online and I thought this is probably a good time in my life to maybe uh, give it a go myself. I'm young enough that if it's a complete disaster I can I can recover from it and um, yeah I thought it'd just be a, a good time to try it out so I did uh, put in my resignation with the printing company and uh, started off uh, on my own with a company called Alliant. And you had no prior entrepreneurial experience or you had no experience building a software company but you decided no. to take up I- I went in incredibly naive, mm-hmm. and uh, I think during those first couple years, I made just about every mistake you can make uh, at least five times each. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I look back and I laugh, and I'm uh, grateful grateful to God for somehow getting through that uh, that period. But uh, I went in with a lot of uh, you know assumptions that just were simply not correct. Um, You know, I was a technical person, and I think I brought some of those uh, assumptions that technical people sometimes make about, you know, especially sales and marketing. Um, I kind of brought that with me and um, made a lot of mistakes. Um, Mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, was very, very humble during those first couple of years. Um, And and did you have any sales experience at all? Because building a product is one problem, but actually going and selling is another problem. Um, not really. I, I was, um, you know, sometimes the sales staff would uh, bring me along to sales calls, um, you know, so I could certainly, you know, I had some background with dealing with, uh, you know, sales opportunities, but I was never in that sales role uh, specifically. So, um, you know, some tough lessons there as well. So obviously you've accomplished a lot, you know, with having no prior entrepreneurial experience whatsoever and building a software company and scaling it and then finally exiting it uh, not, not too long ago. Uh, of all the things that you accomplished in your life, what is one thing that you're super proud of? Um, 
I'm most proud of my my family. You know, mm-hmm. I'm an incredibly blessed man. Been married uh, almost 22 years and uh, two wonderful children. And um, you know, um, very very proud of that. And um, and I think that's a, that's important. I've seen so many people kind of trade you know, their family or trade relationships, you know, to, to pursue, you know, business opportunities. And, um, you know, that's just obviously not a route that's going to leave you uh, very satisfied in life. And uh, so, uh, yeah, most proud of the family, um, for sure. That's awesome to hear because sometimes, like you said, uh, I think at the expense of family, sometimes you can pursue uh, a career or a business idea and you might even win it, but in the process you lose what's most important when you actually finally have money to enjoy uh, you don't mm-hmm. have family to enjoy with yeah which you're 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 in testament to the fact that you can do both right you can successfully build a business and still have an intact family that you you're super proud of um, you know obviously somebody who's you know kind of getting starting in start in an entrepreneurial journey right trying to build a company or even established a business but trying to get to the next level what, what kind of advice do you have for them as they're getting started or actually are uh, in a place where they're they're able to scale up. Sure. Um, first of all, is that it's going to be an awful lot of work. Mm-hmm. Um, that um, it's it's a long journey, and uh, it's as much of a professional journey as it is a, a personal journey as well. Um, so much of what we read, kind of, I think, idealizes that op- entrepreneurial experience. Um, almost makes it sound easy and straightforward and uh, the reality is it's it's a really hard road and uh, it's it's certainly a rewarding one um, but it's difficult there, there's lots of setbacks um, your, your best plans don't always work out um, customers don't always appreciate what you thought they would appreciate you know uh, employees don't always do what you wanted them to do uh, the market doesn't always respond the way uh, you thought it should, and um, so just know that it's a it's a difficult road and it's a long road, but it is a it is a rewarding one as well. Uh, so I think that's really important thing to to recognize to kind of go in just just knowing um, that uh, it's going to be a bit of a an uphill climb. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I think there's there's lots of very specific pieces of advice, you know, needed at specific points within any entrepreneurial journey. Um, but I think in general, you know, there's some really important things that uh, you know the leader needs to do. Um, the first is to to try and stay humble. You know, um, know that you don't know everything. You know, remind yourself that you're not the smartest person in the room or, or on the phone call. Um, when a employee or, or customer is expressing concerns to you or, or frustration to you, uh, even if it doesn't always make sense or if it feels a little bit petty, maybe you know dig deeper and, and kind of get to the the kernel of truth there. You know to really know what they're talking about. Um, you know when the market uh, doesn't go the way you want it to go, don't uh, just uh, blame customers for not being smart enough to recognize. How wonderful your product or service is that, that probably means you're, you're not doing something right mm-hmm. um, so I think you just really need to continually try to um, remain humble uh, know that there is more to learn that you're probably not doing everything the way that needs to be done and that there's lots of room for continual improvement yeah and I, I don't know if you watch any of the TV show like profit um, you know some of those shows that I really enjoy some of these business shows and I see Marcus Lemonas who goes and invests his own personal money to buy into a company. And then this is a company that actually called on Marcus Lemonas because they haven't figured out how to scale. They have either you know product problem, process problem, or you know people problem, right? Something that's really affecting their growth. And oftentimes when he's providing advice, and I see these entrepreneurs who's been probably at it for 15, 20 years, and for to their right, yes, they have, they have been successful in some extent. But then they, they're not willing to take on that advice, right? Because yeah. you sought out the advice, and then why, but you're not willing to take on the feed, feedback. And I think, like you said, being humble enough to admit that I don't have it all figured out, that's, I think, is the biggest uh, you know, skill that an entrepreneur could have or a, a characteristics, I be, believe. Yeah, always, always more to learn, always room to improve. Uh, the minute you think you've arrived, you have definitely not arrived. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah. 
Can you share uh, one of your uh, biggest lesson learned, uh, whether through a failure or one of the success, maybe from, from this journey that you of you building a company? <laughs> well, there, there's so many uh, wonderful failures. Uh, I, I, one of my employees had this great uh, saying. He said, uh, "Sometimes you win, and sometimes you learn." <laughs> And <laughs> I, I've thought about that that often um, over time, and um, you know I think that um, you know we tend to make mistakes in so many ways. You know, one is not really uh, appreciating you know what it takes to actually sell you know the product you know successfully market it and then sell it you know uh, bring it to the point of someone actually you know paying you money for it. Um, I know I've uh, wanted to at many times kind of uh, cut corners and see if we can make that process faster or cheaper and certainly you need to always be asking those questions but uh, I know you know at times I just didn't really always have the the patience or, or the tolerance you know for for everything that it took so I, I think one mistake you know that I made is you know as I look back um, was that I was a little too focused at times on the growth side of the company, mm -hmm. um, and maybe not as focused as much on the uh, operational side as well as um, you know, the, the cost management side. Yeah, and that's tough. You know, when you're growing a company, it is you know it does feel like growth at all costs. You know, mm -hmm. at times, and there's times when you have to make you know some of those decisions um, but uh, I think over time you know the organization continued to to grow uh, which was very very grateful for and I still just kind of continued to focus purely on that uh, growth side bringing in new customers you know generating uh, you know new opportunities and uh, I think I missed a lot of opportunities just to improve what the company was doing and to improve the company's profitability as well Mm -hmm. um, you know, so part of being acquired was that uh, we, were, we were acquired by a, uh, a company called the Valeris Group, which is part of Constellation Software. Um, it's one of these uh, incredibly successful and large companies that you know, most people have never heard of. And uh, the reason is that they are, um, they go and they buy um, smaller software companies and uh, buy and hold them forever. So they're, they're not private equity. Um, where they're going to buy, you know, and then attempt to resell in a couple of years. They they hold it forever, which means they have a, a long-term interest in the success of the company. Uh, and because of that, they have built a lot of best practices around uh, operating a software company, and they have just an incredible talent pool. Um, and um, you know, so buying the company, and then I can I stayed on through the acquisition, and I continued to run uh, Alliant as a, as a business unit, but uh, you know, obviously under their oversight, and um, you know, being introduced to all these best practices, and having uh, people that are just so much smarter and, and gifted that I am come in and look at the business, I, I just kind of had a lot of moments where I thought, wow, I really you know, missed the boat um, on how I could have much more effectively, you know, run this organization. Um, I think we did very well at, at sales and, and growth and new revenue, and those are very important, but um, you do need to look at both sides of the equation. And uh, so certainly I, I wish I had done more around that. I think I didn't have the expertise myself to know. I, I didn't know what I didn't know, which is often the case. Um, but uh, I wish I had recognized that more and actually been, you know, been willing and able to go out and hire some consultants that had that knowledge who could kind of step into the company and, and give that level of uh, direction, you know, and feedback. Can you provide some co context or some example of what were some of the things? Obviously, you figured out selling and you, you poured your heart into it and you hired people um, that were extremely good with, with the product mm -hmm. that they knew what they were selling. They also knew the customer that they were selling to. They were either in the printing business before or had some exposure to the printing company's needs, right? So you figured out that part of it and you were successful at it. That's why somebody was willing to give you money to buy your company. But what were some of the areas that you saw when you actually joined the the, the, the company that acquired you, what were some of the areas where you felt sure. like, man, that was not yeah, something? Yeah, and, 
And, and I think, yeah, you're, you're right. We had, you know, I think we did reasonably well on the sales side. And, uh, and I should just note that we did well because I hired the right people. It wasn't, it wasn't because of me. I, I, it's one of my goals is to surround myself with people who are smarter than me, um, which is uh, pretty easy to do, actually. Um, but uh, I, um, you know, I, I think a lot of it was becoming um, very much of a, a data, um, very data intensive organization. So, you know, we had, uh, for example, you know, an amazing group of technical support people. They were fantastic. Our customers loved them. You know, I think they generally felt very well supported and, um, you know, they're doing their job. But, um, you know, if you were to ask a, a question of me, you know, like, well, how much are you spending, you know, per customer on technical support? Or, you know, you know, what's your top 10 users of technical support and, and what's it costing you versus, you know, what's the revenue that it's bringing in? Uh, to be honest, I wouldn't have been able to tell you that. And so I think a lot of it was just uh, instilling that discipline and the systems around it to, you know, start tracking everything. You know, how much time is it taking to perform key business tasks? You know, how much time are, are support people helping customers? Uh, how much time are developers spending on new features? How much are they spending on bugs, you know? Um, and then start to build in a lot of analysis around that data. You know, well, you know, which support representatives are operating more efficiently? You know, which ones are getting, you know, better results? Which developers are, are you know, coding more efficiently? Which ones are coding with higher degrees of quality? You know, we hadn't really been asking ourselves those sorts of questions because they're, they're very difficult questions to answer. Um, it requires, you know, ongoing data capture, ongoing data analysis, and then setting reasonable targets. You know, so we went through this process of creating, you know, KPIs um, so that we could measure each functional area uh, across a variety of, uh, of, of different um, measurements. And uh, it's hard to do, but uh, the reality is once we started doing that, um, you know, I think you know, we saw ways to increase profitability, we saw ways to increase productivity, you know, we started to see maybe some staff here and there that maybe weren't performing as well as others, and mm -hmm. ideally, you know, at that point, then you can figure out a way to help those employees improve, um, but uh, we just didn't really have as much insight into the company as, uh, as we should have, um, mm -hmm. in retrospect. Yeah, and I think uh, oftentimes the, the problem is, uh, it's a twofold problem. I mean, with the, with the advent of technology, there's a proliferation of data, right? You're collecting every touch point that you have with your customer and even the activities that your employees are performing, that's all being tracked. Uh, it's one thing to track and have that data. It's another thing to take business decisions on what to improve upon and what to eliminate, what to add, right? And that's the, that's the key, um, key ingredient here, it seems like. Uh, I'm, I'm sure with your software, you were able to track a lot of those things in terms of you know, number of conversations you're having to, ha you know, with your sure. you know, customers and how many times you have to show them the same thing or troubleshooting the same problem. All of those, which, all of those things I'm sure you're collecting and tracking. They're, they're, yeah, a lot of them we found were just kind of there, you mm -hmm. know, as part of whatever tool we were using. You know, as you can imagine, like a lot of companies, we had one Ticketing tool system. we used for support, another tool we used for development, another tool for finance, you know, so we had a lot of different tools and, um, Sometimes the data was there, um, and sometimes we suspected it was there, but we couldn't quite get to it. But then, how to get it out? How to analyze it? How to compare it? You know, to data from other functional areas within the company. You know, and then what areas were we not capturing data, but we needed to? You know, it uh, took quite a bit of time to untangle. So obviously, you know, when we talk about building a company, right? You you were the visionary. You had this idea. You went and found development resources. You found the the best salespeople you can. You built the company, which uh, there comes a point you go from that visionary, like you go from you know some of the day-to-day -day operational responsibility to being a full-blown visionary role. Were there ever a time you kind of were playing both, more of a manager sure. function and a visionary uh, a oh, leader function? Absolutely, um, and uh, that probably uh, speaks to your earlier question of you know what are some of the mistakes you made or wish you'd done differently, and. Um, you know, I was, um, you know, came into the as more of a technical person. I actually wrote the first version of the software, um, you know, and uh, we're grateful to start hiring some developers, but I still kind of tried to keep involved in the code base a little bit. 
Um, and you know, the reality is, you know, we were you know, adopted more of an agile approach, and and we had um, you know sprints, you know, which is kind of a simplified. Here's a list of of everything we're going to accomplish from a development perspective within these two weeks. And uh, you know we we divide them up, and um, I often wouldn't get mine done, you know, because I was getting pulled into more of the business stuff. Um, or if I got it done, you know, to be honest, I wasn't really doing it as well as I should have because I just my head wasn't entirely in the game. Um, you know, I'm so grateful. Um, I really worked hard to to build a, a really solid team, and and I was you know very um, blessed to hire people that just had a lot more uh, depth of knowledge and experience in their in their particular areas um, you know our dev manager just you know kind of pulled me inside and, and said Greg you're, you're kind of not helping here you're you're getting in the way he, he said it much more uh, graciously um, but uh, he said you know just, just let me let me handle this part of the business mm -hmm. and um, I agreed and that was you know, one of the best decisions I ever made um, you know, you've probably heard the phrase that the you know the the leader, the manager needs to work on the business rather than in the business, and uh, I think it's a an example of you know an area where I needed to take a step back and um, and uh, trust trust people who are more capable than me to to take care of those areas so that I could focus more working on the business. And that's where I think the those when you were talking about data collection, you need to hire teammates that can actually collect and gather the data and then you need to make business decisions on what the what the teammates are actually doing and what they're actually collecting right um, so that that makes a big difference in terms of what you would do it um, which is probably to change the course of the business if you found certain certain area of the business isn't ready to go in the way it should from the numbers yeah so so where where we you know kind of um, again, I mentioned one of you know that the company that acquired Alliant brought with them a lot of best practices, and uh, one of them was to just kind of very strictly organize yourself along functional lines, you know, so have a very clear, you know, you know leader of the dev team, have a very clear leader of the support team, and um, we we had a little bit more of a matrix situation because we were uh, international, we had an office in the U.S., we had an office in in uh, Europe, and uh, one in India as well. You know, and so we we'd have people in similar roles in you know each of those three companies that uh, were reporting up to different management. And so, part of the goal was to reorganize along functional lines. So we did have just one manager over all the people in that particular department, no matter where they were at. Mm -hmm. um, and then what we did is we put them in charge of capturing their own data and then reporting their own data. And uh, we had a monthly management meeting uh, with myself and uh, all the managers, and uh, each one would present their KPIs. You know, mm -hmm. their um, you know, you, you have all this data, and then you define goals, and basically, a, you know, trying a KPI as much as possible is, you know, you want to kind of distill all that to some you know potentially actionable uh, insight, you know, or feedback, you know, which areas of the company need you know need some help. Um, so yeah, so kind of one of my job was just kind of coordinating and, and you know keeping those functional leaders accountable to measuring you know every aspect of their particular departments and uh, reporting on it. So obviously your outlook on business have changed as you you know um, when you started and when you exited and now I'm sure there's been a lot of iteration of your leadership style and your approach on things change. Can you do you do you can you describe how that uh, outlook changed on sales and marketing specifically, uh, because I know that was kind of sure. where you oversaw most of most of. Right, companies. right. So you know, I I'm I'm almost embarrassed to admit at this point, but uh, you know, I think I came into came into it with a lot of the assumptions that uh, IT guys make. You know that oh, you know this this product is is awesome. You know, people should just buy it. You know. Mm -hmm. you, what do you even need sales or marketing for? People should just see this product and realize how great it is, and just you know want to want to throw their wallets at it and buy it. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously, that's you know incredibly uh, naive and, and just simply not true. Mm -hmm. um, so I really learned to uh, respect you know the the sales process. 
uh, and then the marketing process as well. And um, to start to see them as as really, you know, distinct or, or, or separate efforts that, that have a high degree of coordination, you know, between the two of them. You know, and then certainly in the last 15 years, we've seen a lot of changes, especially in marketing, um, where, you know, the channels that you market through have, have changed quite a bit. Um, and, um, you know, that there's just a lot of, you know, testing in small batches and doing a lot of data capture and data analysis and kind of just continuing to try one thing, you know, measure results, tweak tweak your approach, try something, you know, different based on those results and just kind of this uh, highly iterative approach, um, highly informed by data, you know, rather than just a group of people sitting around a conference room table saying, oh, that seems like a great idea. Um, and so, so we've, I've, you know, been very impressed with, you know, the marketers that uh, the company was able to hire. Uh, that it did a fantastic job of of really kind of trying to guide a land through those through those paradigm changes, and um, um, yeah, we're very successful at doing it. Yeah, and most certainly, yeah. especially we're selling a software. Probably, around, I think it was priced around three hundred dollars a month, if I rem remember right. It was about three hundred dollars a month. Um, um, actually, it was, it was well. I think probably way back when it was at that price point, but uh -huh. um, certainly as its sophistication increased, um, you know, and and it's um, basically you know it its role within a printing company you mm -hmm. know, became elevated as well. Um, you know, that price went up um, for sure. Yeah. So the the reason I was asking is obviously as as marketing marketing gets even more sophisticated, it's really figuring out you know how do we increase the lifetime value right by making sure that the customer stuck around longer and how do you right. reduce the cost of acquisition by figuring out how do we lower the amount of touch it requires human intervention involved to win that customer right and by by doing so you can essentially increase the overall lifetime value of that customer as well. Uh, so were there any efforts internally in terms of tracking all of those key metrics uh, on the marketing side or sales side? Yeah, that, and that, that was very much an ongoing effort because it's, it's hard. Um, it's, it's really hard to know how much have you actually spent, you know, reaching out to that, that customer. Um, you know, we know that um, people often don't really contact a potential vendor until they've made like you know, something like 80% of their decision. You know, forgive me if I'm getting it wrong, mm -hmm. but you know, they do a lot of just research outside of that, um, you know, so, you know, and, you know, so things like going to a trade show, you know, you, that used to be how you sold things within the printing industry. And um, then you really start to look at it and say, well, okay, so maybe this person found us online as a result of a Google ad. And then they were at a trade show and then they talked to us and then they were part of, you know, some you know, marketing content, you know, um, email blasts that we've sent out and then they spoke to, you know, a salesperson and, you know, maybe they went through a couple demos and, you know, the reality is you've, you've had a lot of touch points with that customer and it's, um, it's not easy to always really fully get a, a full perspective on, on all that time and, and uh, costs that you had associated with uh, bringing them through the sales process. Uh, yeah, we were working on it. Um, Salesforce is the tool that we were using. You know, it does have all the ability to start to record, you know, all those different types of interactions, you know, within the system, you know, and uh, as do a lot of other platforms as well. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's really critical to do that, um, and then to kind of again, you know, keep analyzing. Well, what was the quickest path, you know, and um, you know. What uh, what you know to your point, what type of customer is going to stick around the longest as, as well? Because uh, uh, you know attrition is a major concern for SaaS companies. Um, you you need to keep looking at that because uh, marketing is one of those areas where you can burn money very very quickly, mm -hmm. and uh, you need to make sure you're you're spending those uh, those dollars as wisely as possible. So the, which brings me to the money question. So obviously when you were when you were building this company, you didn't take any private money at all, right? It was completely self-funded. You grew yep. it all out of uh, the revenue that you were generating, uh, which brings a completely different dynamics than a SaaS company who went and 
raise some, some capital because they can infuse mm-hmm. so much money into sales and marketing and they can just penetrate the market and own it, right? And oftentimes get that first mover advantage because they were the first to the, uh, to the game and they were able mm-hmm. to scale up really, really fast and capture as much of the market share as possible. So what advice do you have for somebody who may be getting started with a SaaS company or even any sort of business where, yes, they do need to grow, but they need to grow healthy as opposed to just burning cash and trying to get to the end, you know, finish line fast. Yeah, um, it, it's a it's it, it's a double edged sword. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I look back and and you know, keep in mind when I started the company, it was kind of in the earlier days of when SaaS companies were emerging. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's still a bit of a newer concept. Um, you can argue not as much competition either. Mm-hmm. And um, I was able to you know kind of just you know bootstrap it all and. Um, it was some very long hours and, you know, uh, working part time and, uh, you know, to kind of still bring in enough uh, <laughs> money, you know, I had a, my wife and a two year old at the time. And uh, yeah, so it was, it was stressful, but I was able to do that. Um, mm-hmm. um, and I think one of the benefits, well, there, there's actually there's a number of benefits to that. You know, the first is that. Um, you own it all, um, so you're you're not diluting whatever your ownership is, um, and uh, so ultimately, you know, the reward has the potential to be higher, but not not always, you know. Mm-hmm. So, um, the other another benefit is that you can focus on building the business. Uh, you you don't have the stress of of keeping uh, investors happy. Mm-hmm. Um, at one point, I did consider, you know, looking for some investments, and I, I went to one of my customers that uh, uh, I knew he did fairly well in his business, and I knew that he had invested in other companies, and I just, you know, had a good relationship, and I just asked him, you know, is that something you'd be interested in doing? And he said, um, he said, Greg, I could, you know, let's say I wrote you a check for, you know, hundred thousand dollars. He said, you have to know that every year I'm going to be coming back to you and saying, you know, I, I want some return on that money. You know, give me give me ten thousand dollars. You know, I want 10 percent return every year on my investment. He said, do you really want that? You know, mm-hmm. is that really worth, you know, the money that I would give you? And um, I'm so grateful that he asked me that question. I thought about it and I realized at that point, no, that's not what I was interested in. Mm-hmm. Um, that it would be helpful to have those funds, but I could survive without it. Uh, I think the third benefit may actually be the biggest though, um, is that when you don't have much, it forces you to make really careful decisions. Um, I've had the benefit of seeing some other businesses up close. I've seen some that uh, received lots of uh, investment dollars, uh, made great decisions, and, and returned the, that investment multiple times over. Um, but I've also seen some that um, basically just kind of had a big pile of money and um, burned it and had almost nothing to show for it because they. You know, they weren't um, held in check by the reality of needing to sell or to keep a customer happy. They had mm-hmm. funds. And uh, I look back and I think, you know, I I had to really think through every decision I made in terms of the product, in terms of uh, marketing, um, any other expense. Um, and uh, it forced me to always consider what's going to make my customers happy, what's going to make them you know, give me more money for this product or continue to be a customer or attract new customers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so especially for someone that uh, went into this without a whole lot of entrepreneurial experience, um, I'd say it really kept me honest. Um, And so I I look back and I'm, I'm glad that it played out the way that it did. Yeah, and having access to capital is is good because especially when you're trying to bring on an engineering team to build a product or if you're trying to um, generate new awareness, especially if you're you know breaking into a category of business that hasn't been around, there's not much awareness for a product or service that you're offering. So there's definitely uh, some value in, in having capital, but I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think oftentimes having limited resources force you to be more innovative in your thinking and then come up with solutions that you wouldn't have, uh, you know, if you actually had yeah. a lot of free free cash later out uh, to do things. Yeah, yeah, I I would encourage anyone to uh, put off, you know, raising funds as much as possible. It's, you know, for most businesses that's just a reality, mm-hmm. um, and uh, you know it's probably going to have to happen at some point. 
but you know, put that off as long as you can. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think it will really kind of build in some good discipline into your company you know, before you have those funds. Yeah, and I think sometimes I watch like Shark Tank and I, I see them taking like $100,000. I'm like, you really need $100,000? You're already making sales. Mm -hmm. You gotta figure out how can you save up $100,000 so you can reinvest without, like you said, diluting your, your equity. Um, so obviously over the years, I think it's almost 14 years or something you ran the company for, uh, you probably heard a lot of advices. Can you think of some, some poor bad advices you've heard of building companies <laughs> that you could share? Oh sure, um, I, yeah. I got a lot of a lot. I got a lot of great advice over the years, and and, and uh, some bad pieces as well. Um, uh -huh. You know, I think um, I remember one. I, I was considering, you know, um, you know, when I was looking at the competitive landscape, there was a feature in, in our product that um, some of our competitors had that we didn't have, mm -hmm. and, and quite frankly, the only way to get it was to to license it uh, from a third party, and it was a very expensive. Uh, licensing arrangement and I didn't necessarily have customers I mean I had an occasional customer tell me it would be nice to have um, but um, you know I just kind of felt like why wow, we we don't have this and everyone else does and you know and I got some advice you know from someone that uh, was in the software space who said oh you absolutely have to have it if you know and um, you know, I went and signed a very expensive licensing uh, agreement for it and um, sold very little of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think the, the bad advice fundamentally if I were to distill it was, you know, was pursuing competitors rather than pursuing what my customers are actually telling me. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly you need to be very aware of your competitive landscape, um, but but really your, your guide or, or What's going to help you make the best decisions for your company are your customers. Mm -hmm. You know, stay close to your customers, listen to what they're telling you, not just one, but lots of them, you know, and then kind of maybe disregard some of the outliers or the edge cases. But, um, you know, you, you just have to focus on on, uh, on the people that actually use your products or, or have the potential to use your products, you mm -hmm. know, to know what's best. Yeah, and I know, which brings me to my, my question here, you know, you, you're not super outspoken about your faith, but people who know you personally, they know you're a Christian. Um, but you also uh, kind of made it aware to me, your faith has, you know, kind of formed your decisions on wh who you bring on to your teammates, who do you serve as, and, and even the fact that you didn't really even take external capital, I'm sure that was kind of informed by your own, your own, you know, your convictions. Uh, so talk to me a little bit about how your faith has formed the way you ran, ran your business. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I'm a, I'm a, a Christian, and um, I think one of the most important things to me is is treating others um, in a Christ-like way, and and I think practically that means a couple things. Number one, treating people with dignity and respect. Um, I think everyone's had a job at some point where they were just treated very poorly, you know, by their by their manager or by their coworkers, um, and it's just such a demoralizing experience. Um, and uh, I've just found if if you can treat people with respect, um, first of all, they really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, you'll on a very practical level, um, you know, you, you're probably going to be rewarded by increased loyalty. Uh, they're probably going to work harder. Um, it also just creates this wonderful culture, um, you know. So I think part of it is I, is I really try not to tolerate uh, employees disrespecting each other, uh, and I extended that to, to customers and vendors as well. Um, you know that if I ever got wind of of someone, you know, acting in in a way that was less than respectful, you know, we would have a conversation about that, and uh, you know, sometimes that that would result in some apologies as well. Um, but uh, yeah, if, if you have this culture where everyone's respectful, um, I, I think some wonderful things happen. You know, uh, beyond the loyalty, I think people feel uh, safe. Uh, they feel safe to try new things. You know, um, which is so important in a company. You know, not everything is going to work that you try, but you need to keep trying new things. And, and I think it just kind of helps create this culture where it's okay. You know, to try things, um, it's okay to admit when you've made mistakes. You know, and then we can fix the problem. And we can learn from it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so that's really important. Um, 
and I think closely related, another key principle is is just being honest. Um, you know, I think in business, there's you know, there's always this temptation to be a little bit dishonest or or spin the truth so much that it's effectively dishonest. You know, and and that can be you know when you're talking about your product and you want to close that sale, you know, um, or you're, you're dealing with a customer that's unhappy and you just want to tell them something, you know, to, to make them happy or give them a little more hope or uh, whatever it is. Um, I've just found that that being honest is very much appreciated. Um, had this um, meeting with one of our, our bigger clients and, um, you know, I went to their office and I was in the conference room and uh, there was some of the C-level executives there, and um, one of them said, you know, Greg, we want you to know that uh, Alliant is one of our favorite vendors, and I was very flattered to hear that, and I immediately thought it must be because our, you know, product is so amazing, our support team is so amazing, um, um, and he said, but he continued, and he said, you know, and the reason for that is you're just always very honest with us. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you don't you don't lie. You don't try to to change what happened. If 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 you guys make a mistake, you own it. You you fix it. You make it right. Um, he said we just feel like we can trust you, and that's not something that we you know feel about a lot of uh, or some of our other vendors. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and I think you know I can't claim that I was always successful in in either of these um, areas. You know I, I know I've made a lot of. A lot of mistakes, you know, like uh, like everyone else. Um, but I, I think people uh, hopefully fundamentally felt like I was always trying to be honest, forthright, um, treat them with dignity and respect. And um, you know, I look back and I think that was probably even more important than the business strategy or, or anything else. So, any par- um, okay. any parting wisdom for our audience, Greg? Sure. If you are, you know, considering becoming an entrepreneur, or if you are one, you know, especially in the earlier stages, um, you know, go, like like I've encouraged you, go in with kind of your your eyes wide open. Know that it's uh, it's going to be a lot of work, but um, you know, enjoy the experience. Um, stay humble. Keep learning. Treat others really, really well, and um, they will treat you well in return. Well, thank you so much for, Greg, your time this afternoon and sharing some of your experience and your wisdom with us. Uh, We wish you all the best, and thanks again. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure. This episode of Coffee with Closers is brought to you by One IMS, a leading digital marketing agency helping businesses win new customers. To request a free marketing ROI audit, please visit oneims.com. If you enjoyed this video, please share it. To make sure you never miss an episode, please subscribe.